come out tonight. We're going to start with number 655. Number 655. <laughs> Honey in the rock, let's dance just like together. Oh, my brother, have you know the Savior who is wondrous, kind and true? He's the rock of your salvation. There's honey in the rock for you. Oh, there's honey in the rock, my brother. There's honey in the rock for you. Leave your sins for the blood to cover. There's honey in the rock for you. Verse 3. Do you pray unto God the Father? What wilt thou have me to do? Never fear he will be answered. There's honey in the rock for you. Oh, there's honey in the rock, my brother. There's honey in the rock for you. Leave your sins for the blood to cover. There's honey in the rock for you. Let's go out through the streets and by way. Turn to one more number 
861. 861. Set my soul afire, Lord. Let's stand for this one. Set my soul afire, Lord, for thy holy word. into their charge, and when he had said this, he fell asleep. I wanted to begin tonight in this passage, and we're going to move over to our main text, but we have the death of Stephen, and we find in this text who is mentioned here but Saul. A young man's feet, the clothing of Stephen, is laid down, and we know that Saul 
became the Apostle Paul. And the Lord changed his name and, and he was uh, Saul of Tarsus, but he became the Apostle Paul and he was used greatly of the Lord in the book of Acts and in the, in the early church. But I wanted to stop here for a moment because we find a witness here. We find the witness of Stephen. And his witness is, well, he, was, he believed the Lord and as a result, he was stoned for what he believed. And he looked up into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So he visibly, he, he saw Jesus and he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, can you imagine someone saying, I see heaven open and I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. You would think that would cause people to stop and reflect and think, wow, he's really seen something. There's something to what this man had been preaching. But instead, they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their uh, clothes on a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And so Stephen was stoned. And, he, and his witness was, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And he was, as he cried up on the name of the Lord, he called upon the name of the Lord, saying, Receive, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So he was a witness right up to the very moment that he died. And the Apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus at that time, he was the one who wanted to see Stephen stoned, and he wanted to see other Christians put into prison. But we know that he was wonderfully saved, Saul was, and as a result, he was greatly used of God in the, in the early church in seeing many churches form, many individuals turn to the Lord Jesus, receive him as their personal Savior, and then those little churches are established in different cities. And so we've been doing a little study a long time ago. <laughs> a long time ago we were doing a study. And I thought, well... We'll continue a little bit of this and uh, have a little bit of a review from last time. It's going to wake up and there we go. So we have, the, we have great missionary journeys. Now, does any of the boys and girls know how many missionary journeys the Apostle Paul went on? You can just say it if you know. How many? One, two, or three? Three missionary journeys. And so the Apostle Paul, his first missionary journey, took him to many different cities. And we studied a long time ago in some of those areas. As he went into, and did, did the Apostle Paul, when he went on his missionary journeys, every single city, see him, they said, come on in and preach Jesus to us. No, a lot of them were very upset that he was coming in and preaching the Lord Jesus. And so, uh, in fact, many of them even threw him out of the city. But there were many that came to know Jesus as their Savior as a result of his missionary journeys. And so we have, the, we have his first journey, and then we have the, uh, the second journey that he went on. And then uh, we, ha when we studied quite a while ago his, the third missionary journey. And that's, that, that's kind of a harder map to follow, isn't it? <laughs> because he certainly went to many places. And, but at the end of that journey, if you look over to Acts chapter 20, I preached this message not too long ago. And he gathered himself to the elders at, from, uh, from Ephesus, and they were in Miletus. And um, he said in verse number 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And certainly we could say that the Apostle Paul desired to be a witness and a testimony no matter where he went. And so, as he journeys back to Jerusalem, 
The first thing, before we know it, he's taken and he's arrested. And then we find that, um, keeps going back to the first year, but I'll find my way through here. Um, he returns to Jerusalem and then we find him journey to Rome, imprisonment in Caesarea, yeah. So this, we were at this point when we kind of left off long ago. Paul brought news of his third journey to the elders of Jerusalem at the Jerusalem church who rejoiced at his ministry, but Paul's presence soon stirred up the Jews who per persuaded the Romans to arrest him. A plot to kill Paul was uncovered, so Paul was taken by night to uh, Antipretus and then transferred to the provincial prison at Caesarea. And so Caesarea is where the Apostle Paul is as we come into chapter 24. And so what I want to notice in chapter 24 is we find Paul now, he's in prison. We know that many of the epistles are going to be written during his time in jail. You say, well, what can you do when you're in jail? Uh, well, the Lord had a lot of work for Paul to do while he was in jail because there was a lot of these New Testament letters that were written while he was in prison. And they were written after, it, it just we recognize that God has a plan in everything. God gave Paul liberty to go from city to city to city, preach the gospel, souls were saved, and then the Lord puts him in prison prison and allows him to be able to, uh, uh, you know, write uh, letters to them. And here we have the word of God before us. And so we recognize that God has a hand in everything when we think, oh, well, Paul's in prison, what can happen now? Uh, there's nothing more that can be done. Well, we find that he is a great witness and testimony, even in those times. And so what I want to think about tonight is it doesn't matter where we are. We can be a witness and we can be a testimony to the Lord. I was speaking to a gentleman just today and he was just being so thankful. He's in hospital and, and so thankful that he can be a testimony. He said, the Lord just given me such great boldness even in, through times of sickness. And so it doesn't matter where the Lord places us. Where we're found, the Lord can use us for His glory. And so, if we're willing to be used of Him. Now, we come to uh, chapter 24, and Paul is in Caesarea. And I'm going to read through a section of this chapter, and we're going to look at several parts of it. And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders, and with, certain or with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he had called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that this, that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence, we accept it always, in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, <coughs> and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader for, of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also hath gone about to profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged him according to our law. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us and with great violence, took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee, by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. So we have this accusation brought. The Apostle Paul's there, and, uh, and this great orator they bring. Uh, he kind of puts you in mind of uh, the lawyer who's going to kind of set the scene and, and uh, open things up, and we'll come back. But then we find that Paul has this defense. Now, he, he has an opportunity to speak. And notice his witness. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast... Uh, been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the the way which they call heresy, so worship I, the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. 
And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Not after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee, and object if they had ought against me. Or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice that I cried, standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfectly perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them, and said, When Lysias the chief captain shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or to come unto him. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Jerusalem, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix, And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I, ha when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him, whereof he sent for him the, off the oftener and communed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul back. So we read, I read the whole chapter, and may the Lord bless the reading of his word tonight, but I wanted to just kind of get the context of Paul's time in Caesarea. We find that there are those that bring accusation to the Apostle Paul and against him, and that's something that uh, they tried to do all along the way and tried to discredit his ministry. And so the religious leaders arrive, and the chief priests and the elders, and they come with this gentleman named Tertullus. And uh, boy, he had a—he was an orator. He was one that could put words together. And uh, if you were to kind of get someone to write an essay, maybe he would be someone to write, because he, you see his words here, Seeing that by thee we enjoy a great quietness, and a very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. We accept it always, in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. And so he opens it up and he can just sense that he's, you know, he must have something very important to say. If he, he can have these nice big swelling words and he can kind of allure us by his speech. <laughs> but then what does he begin to do? He begins to accuse uh, and, and make a case against the Apostle Paul. First of all, he called, he, he, there's three charges that we can perhaps find against Paul. There's a personal charge. We, he, he calls him a pestilent fellow in verse 5. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow. Now, uh, the word pestilent often is used to a, a reference a plague, but it's also meaning like a troublemaker. They call him Paul a troublemaker. Now, the Apostle Paul wasn't going into towns looking to cause trouble. In fact, it, he desired to preach the truth, share the truth with others, and where uh, light goes out, it's oftentimes that the devil is going to want to attack. And that's often the way that trouble found uh, the Apostle Paul or difficulties are, uh, came about as a result of sharing the truth. And so he, he calls him uh, a troublemaker. He call, and We could say there's another charge that goes against Paul and it's perhaps a political charge. And it says he, he's a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. He's a mover of sedition. Now, this political charge, we could say, and, and uh, of Paul involved in uh, creating an illegal religion. And Paul preached to the Jews that the Lord Jesus Christ was their king and that he was their Lord. And to the Romans and the unbelieving uh, world, this message sounded like treason against Caesar. And um, they... Uh, even presented that when the Lord Jesus was going to go to the cross. We have no king but Caesar, they cried. And so it wasn't a legal thing to establish a new religion in Rome without the approval of the authorities. So they said, well, if we can't get Paul for, for the fact that we call him a troublemaker, we're going to say he's going around and he's creating a new religion and, and uh, causing sedition and causing people to turn from Caesar and turn to this Jesus, the king of the Jews. And he says, and then they also go and they mention that he has profaned the, the temple. And he's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who hath also gone about to profane the temple. 
And, and then they said, whom we took, and would have judged them according to our law. And so he says, and we arrested them as soon as he caused problems. And boy, they were looking for opportunity to arrest Paul. And uh, it didn't matter where the Apostle Paul went in his missionary journeys. Word would get back to Jerusalem that, that the, uh, Jews were being saved and that Gentiles were being saved. And uh, the Jews were quick to put uh, an end to the Apostle Paul's ministry. But in fact, the, the, the desire to suppress his ministry caused it even to flourish so much greater because now who is he in front of? He's in front of Festus or, or Felix. Then he's going to be in front of Festus. Then he's going to be in front of Agrippa. And then he's going to go to Rome. And we're going to find the Apostle Paul in front of all these world leaders. And he has the opportunity to, to share Jesus to them. And so when the Jews, their desire was to, to silence the message. But as a result, the message of the Lord Jesus just grew and grew and grew. Do you know that's happening today in the world in some places? There are places. Does anybody know of any countries in the world where it's illegal to have a Bible or to share Jesus? China. In China, yeah. Any other countries you can think of? There's other places like, like Iran. Any other places? Um, Korea, North Korea might be another place. And... And and what's happening there? People are being told they're not allowed to have a Bible. Yeah, China. And they're not allowed to have a Bible and, and share the message of Jesus with others. And as a result, there's people being saved everywhere. The Lord's allowing His Word to be spread around. And so when we may not hear of... Uh, 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 of uh, we might not see pictures all the time of, of the church that's just growing in places like China and Korea and other places... But it is, and we hear reports every now and then of just Christians that have come to the Lord. And uh, there's a lot of Christians in Afghanistan and other places as well. And so we recognize that the devil will always want to suppress his word, but the Lord can even work through those situations. And so that's what's happening in the life of the Apostle Paul. So this... They, they bring this accusation. They think they have all the, the T's crossed and the, di the I's dotted as it were. And now Paul has an opportunity to speak. Now Paul doesn't bring a lawyer with him and say, now you're going to stand up for me and, and give my defense. Paul says, I'm going to speak. And uh, Paul, after the governor had beckoned on him to speak. Now, we just mentioned as well that Paul was very respectful in, these, uh, in the, the proceedings. He allowed the others to say their part. And even though uh, they're... They were falsely accusing him in many ways. He didn't stand up and say, no, it's a bold-faced lie. I didn't do that. No, he, they, he let them have their part, and he showed restraint, and the Lord gave him restraint in that time, and now the time for him was to be able to come up and to speak. And so it says he's very respectful to the, to the governor, and the governor beckons on him to speak, and he answers, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. And he thought that he called he he looked at it as a privilege to be able to stand before this governor and to be able to give an answer. And so he says, because thou mayest understand, in verse eleven, that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up in the the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee. So he says, these are the things I, I wasn't doing. Either I wasn't causing problems. I wasn't disputing and arguing with people and raising up to a great big uproar. He says, but this is what I was doing. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And so he said, I believe all those things that are written in the Law and the Prophets. And the, the Jewish leaders were supposed to believe those things that were written in the Law and the Prophets. And so the Apostle Paul says, I believe those things. And they're calling me a, he a heretic, a, a heresy. And he says, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. He says, boy, we're in agreement with some of these things here because uh, I believe the Law and the Prophets. They claim to believe the Law and the Prophets. I, I believe in the resurrection of the dead, both the just and the unjust, and so do they. And he says, and herein do I exercise myself to always, to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. That's a great verse. 
when it comes to being a witness and testimony in our, our stand for the Lord, and uh, a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. So he has the opportunity to stand up to Felix and to, op- to give his uh, testimony. And, and he, he goes on, but I want to focus on another section of this. Uh, because in verse 24, and after certain days, when Felix came with his wife to Jerusalem, Felix, uh, or which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now what was happening was Paul's testimony and his witness was actually having an impact upon the governor. In fact, the Holy Spirit of God was working in his heart, so it says he trembled. What was he preaching to him? Righteousness, temperance, which is self-control, that's a fruit of the Spirit, and judgment to come. Now, the governor had judgment. He could place judgment and and have authority. But Paul was preaching judgment that's to come and judgment that's over every governor, every authority that is. And we know that Jesus is coming. And Felix trembled. And what did he say? He said, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. And what a dangerous phrase that is. When God speaks to our heart and we say, Oh, I don't want to hear it. Go thy way. At a more convenient time, I'll call you. And you know, there have been many that have said those words in one way or another. They have either turned from the Lord's leading in their heart, when they knew that they were to do something, or they were to do right, or maybe the Spirit of God was convicting them about being saved and about needing to trust Christ as their Savior. And Felix had an opportunity. He heard the Word of God and heard the preaching of the Gospel. For the righteousness of God, of temperance, and of judgment that was to come. And he said, go thy way. And so that's a warning to us that we wouldn't say, go thy way to the Lord and to his leading when he speaks to our hearts. But Paul had an opportunity to be a witness. When we started, we, we saw him at, at the feet. Uh, they were... Of Stephen, and they were throwing the clothing at the feet of Saul, and Stephen was being stoned, and Stephen was being a witness. Now the Apostle Paul has had an opportunity to be a witness in all those areas, through all those missionary journeys. And now he's going to have even an opportunity to be a witness in prison. You know, in the prison, he had great liberty. It said in verse 23, And he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty. And that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or to come on to him. What a blessing that would have been. Paul in prison and he was going to be allowed all the visitors he wanted. There was no visitor restrictions for the Apostle Paul. We hear visitor restrictions all the time. And uh, went to the hospital today. That was the first thing he said. Visitor restrictions. You've got to be careful in certain times and certain places. And, uh, but Paul had no visitor restrictions. And that was just a wonderful blessing for encouragement for him. And uh, as he would begin to write the letters of the epistles, as the Lord would lead him, and then as he would have continued opportunity to be a testimony and a light to to uh, Felix. And um, he's going to then come before Festus. It's going to be two years, and feast, uh, uh, Festus is going to come into Felix's position, and uh, Paul is going to remain bound. Uh, but we're going, and we know that Felix also, uh, it's interesting what money will do. In verse 26, he hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him, whereof he sent him the oftener and communed with him. He was hoping that maybe Paul would slip him some Monday money under the table and, and then he would release Paul from his imprisonment. Um, and, uh, and those kind of crooked things happen today as well. And, and they were happened in the days of the Apostle Paul. But Paul remained in prison. He knew God had a plan for him. And uh, he knew that the Lord was calling him to go back to Jerusalem. And yes, that there, there was most likely going to be danger that he was going to experience there. But he knew that uh, the Lord was with him. And he gives testimony to his uh, witness 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's an example for us of how we can be a testimony. It doesn't matter who we're in front of. It doesn't matter if it's a neighbor or if it's a governor or a king that we're in, in front of. That we can bear testimony to uh, with how the Lord has saved us. And he will reference his salvation testimony many times as he speaks to Agrippa and to others. And uh, to be a, a light for the Lord. All right. Well, thank you for your attention tonight. And we'll uh, stop our lesson there.